This morning's lesson comes from Isaiah chapter 5 and chapter 11, and it's a little bit difficult to understand. The one thing that we have to, to, to I think, know first is last week we had Hosea, right? Pastor Bethany was here and talked to you about the, the to the northern kingdom. And Hosea and Isaiah lived at the same time. These messages were given at the same time. One to the northern kingdom, one to the southern kingdom. Now, it probably isn't that Hosea and Isaiah knew each other, but they both lived at the same time and they gave a message to their, to their kingdoms at roughly the same point in time. So this morning we get this passage from Isaiah chapter 5, which is an interesting passage, I have to say. It's actually a song, right? That's what Isaiah says. Let me sing for my beloved, my love song concerning his vineyard. Right? And who is Isaiah's beloved? Say it louder. Say it like you mean it. God. Right? Isaiah is going to sing a song for us about his beloved. And his beloved is God. And God has a vineyard. Is it actually a vineyard? No, it's not. But let's pretend that it is for a moment. Right? So God has this hill, and on this hill is a very fertile hill, and on this very fertile hill, God prepares his, his vineyard. He takes the time to dig it out. He gets rid of all of the stones. He makes sure that the soil is perfect to plant this vineyard in, right? He digs it. He gets rid of the stones. He plants it with choice vines. He plants a watchtower in the middle of it so that people can watch over it. He hews out a wine vat so that they can make wine. And he expects it to, to yield the most wonderful grapes to make the best wine ever. But what happens? They're not what was expected. Right? God did all of this great work of preparing the soil, of making things perfect, And he planted the most choice seeds. He, he picked out the best parts of what he could. And then he planted it. And he did everything for this vineyard. He loved it. And did exactly what he could have done for it. And then the vineyard turned on him. Right? That's what it says. God did everything that he could. And he planted the best seeds. But then the grapes became wild. Right? And then what happens? Verse 3. And now inhabitants of Jerusalem and people of Judah judge between me and my vineyard. Who is now singing the song? Who started this song? What book is it from? Isaiah. Isaiah started the song. I'm going to sing for you a song about my beloved and his vineyard. Right? I'm going to sing for you a song about God and his vineyard. And it was planted on this, I'm not going to go through all that again. The beautiful hill, and it was, I did all the great stuff. And then verse 3, and now inhabitants of Jerusalem and people of Judah judge between me and my vineyard. Now singing. Isaiah is no longer telling us this story. God is now taking over. Right? He says, now, you people of Jerusalem and Judah, you people of the kingdoms, Tell me what has happened between me and my vineyard. Tell me what has happened here. Why are there wild grapes? Why have I done all of this stuff to get what I'm getting? And then he says, what more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done? Right? God says to the people of the kingdom, I gave you everything. I gave you what you needed. I made the soil perfect. I made the, the hedge in the middle, and I put the hedge around you, and I made the watchtower, and I made the, the vat to make the wine in, and I did everything that I could. So why did you turn on me? That's what he says. And now, verse 5, God says, now I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm not going to take care of you anymore. I'm not going to prune you. I'm not going to cut you back. I'm not going to water you. I'm not going to kill you. I'm not going to do anything. I'm actually going to even remove the hedge of protection that is around you so that you will be trampled. 
and you will be destroyed. The gospel of our Lord, right? The good news of God right here, right now, right? That's what this is. God says, I did everything I could for you, yet you turned your backs on me and did what you wanted on your own. So I'm not going to deal with you anymore. I'm not going to prune you. I'm not going to take care of you. I'm not going to even allow you to have a hedge of protection or a wall around you. Everything is going to be trampled and everything is going to be destroyed. Right? That's what it says in verse 5. Nothing's going to be hoed. Nothing's going to be pruned. Everything's going to be overgrown. It's not going to be weeded. There's, there's going to be briars and thorns and it's going to be completely a mess. And on top of that, I'm also not going to allow rain to come. So there's no way that the vineyard is going to be able to even grow and maintain and overcome what is coming against it. <clears throat> For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel and the people of Judah are his pleasant planting. Right? That's verse 7. God finally says, after all of this stuff that's going to happen, that I'm, not going to no, I'm, I'm no longer going to take care of you. Now you need to understand that you are my vineyard. And you have turned your backs on me. God expected justice, and he saw bloodshed. He expected righteousness, but he heard a loud cry. God tilled and planted and made sure that everything was going to be perfect. But then the people turned on him and did what they wanted. And if that was the end, there would be no good news. But just like I told the kids up here, we can't leave it at that. Because even in the midst of everything going wrong, even in the midst of the people of God turning their backs on Him and following after their own desires, and God saying, I'm not doing it anymore. I'm not pruning or hoeing. I'm not taking care of you. God still gives a way out. Because there's always hope. You see that shoot that comes out of the stump of Jesse? is an alliteration back to chapter 5 where the vineyard is destroyed and completely left a wasteland. That there's nothing left there for anything to grow from. But yet even out of the desolation, the shoot comes forth from the stump of Jesse. The shoot comes forth. And that shoot is? Because there's always hope. Right? Did you recognize the rest of Isaiah chapter 11, where that comes from? Or, or where, we, where we use it? I said where it comes from. It, it comes, when we use it, it comes from here. We don't actually. You know. Did you get that, though? The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon the Spirit of Wisdom. And understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Baptism. Baptism. This directly out of the, we took that part from the baptism service directly out of Isaiah chapter 11. Because that's the hope, right? That Christ will come, the Savior will come, and he will not judge with his eyes or with his ears. He won't judge with what he sees or what he hears, but he's going to judge with what he knows in his heart is the truth. And the truth will prevail. And hope will always reign. Because Jesus is not going to do as we did. This, the shoot that comes out of the stump is not going to turn his back on the Father. He will judge with equity. He will judge with justice. And he will be our hope. And if we can follow after him and do what God has called us to do, then we too shall spread the hope that God has given us. That's the good news for today. To know that even when things seem to be laid a waste, that there's always hope that that shoot is going to come from the stump and that he will be with us always to give us the hope that we need see us through to the next day. That's the hope that we have. We want to see. So remember, 
even when it seems that things are wasted, there's always hope. There's always 